In this episode of Milk Drunk, we are honoring Mother's Day by discussing how a life-threatening illness transformed a mother-daughter relationship. While this episode is meant to celebrate the ever-evolving bond between parents and children, we recognize that this can also be a challenging time for those who have experienced loss, infertility, or strained relationships with their own mothers. We want to acknowledge and validate these difficult emotions and experiences. We encourage you to listen with an open mind and heart, but of course, feel free to skip this one, and we'll see you next time. Welcome to Milk Drunk by Bobby a straight-up conversation about parenthood without the BS. We'll be featuring parenting experts, people you may recognize, and some others you might be meeting for the first time. Milk Drunk is brought to you by Bobby, the mom-founded and led organic formula brand shaking the stigma around how we choose to feed our babies. Our goal is to have open and honest conversations that make parents feel less alone. Think group chat energy. And I will be sending you photos of the handmade flowers my kids gave me for Mother's Day. You're welcome. I'm your host, Angelica Temple, and today we are serving up the mother of all episodes. We are joined by OG Motherboard member Laura Dern and her legendary mother, Diane Ladd, to talk about motherhood through the generations, the importance of community child raising, and the ongoing fight for the future. After Diane developed a life-threatening illness, she and Laura started to go on long walks and started spilling the beans. Those walk and talks formed the basis of their new book, Honey Baby Mine. So let's give a warm welcome to Laura and Diane. Welcome, both of you. I'm so excited to have you here. We're excited to be here. Good morning. Laura, you you are one of Bobby's earliest supporters. You have been on this wild ride with us since before we even launched. Tell me how you got involved and what resonated with our mission. Well, Laura, I'll let you go talk. Okay. Okay, okay, great. I had the privilege of meeting amazing Laura Modi and knowing her mission statement to support other mothers, uh, sharing her earliest journey of motherhood um, mm-hmm. and her breastfeeding journey. And I, I just fell in love with her passion, um, our mutual amazing friend and early Bobby champion, Irina Metavoy, connected us. And it meant a great deal to me um, and is an interesting segue into why mom and I are speaking today because, mm-hmm. you know, I have my own story, but it's a story that involves um, my work in environmental awareness around Mm -hmm. pesticides, petrochemicals, Mm -hmm. um, and chemicals in food that I learned when my children were babies, Mm -hmm. um, how much junk is in formula. Mm -hmm. And when I needed to turn to formula with my second child, with my daughter, Uh, I was just shocked to find that there were no organic products available to me in the United States. Mm -hmm. I was in the UK and with a great deal of research, found some alternative and started begging doctors to help me find my way to something that could support my daughter. And, Mm -hmm. you know, turning to now a number of years later, my mom and I are here sharing our book, which its origin story is in and around the fact that my mother was exposed to pesticides in her residential community with farms surrounding her house, uh, spraying with glyphosates, Danitol, um, and other petrochemicals, which caused scarring on her lungs and brought Mm. us to a journey of walking to try to expand her lung capacity and mm-hmm. please God save her life and therefore mm-hmm. started having conversations we had never had before. But mm-hmm. I felt so lucky. Um, Laura came to a beautiful event our, our amazing friend Amy Griffin had for us about the book and Laura came and I said, Laura, I'm so excited we get to have a conversation talking to our friends um, who are Bobby champions because Mm -hmm. it's the same story. The same story is 
how how are we taking care of ourselves and how are we still in a loop as a country, as a culture, as mothers, mm-hmm. as daughters, as friends, that we can't provide clean air, clean water, and clean food mm-hmm. for ourselves and our newborn babies. So mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm such a proponent and fan, as you can hear, but also here I am you know, wanting my mother to be well for the same worries that I had when I was trying to figure out how I could feed my daughter. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's even the the landscape has changed so much even since I had my first kid six years ago. And I was desperate for all the European formulas. And we'll we'll get back to some of that. And really, I'd love to hear more about your feeding journeys and all of that good stuff. But, you know, why we're here and what you mentioned is you guys just put out this book, Honey Baby Mine. It's an incredible incredibly heartfelt deep dive into your mother-daughter relationship, as well as parenting. And I think, and how we continue to parent each other in these through different generations. And it's funny because after devouring your book myself, I found myself, yes, thinking about how to be a better, more connected mother. And I'm going to ask you for some advice on that. But I also (laughs) thought a a lot about how to be a better grown-up daughter, you know, and just, and it really gave me a different perspective on how important of course, I know how important that relationship comes to be um, and continues to be. Mm-hmm. And you have this new connection after you have kids and everything. Um, but I would love to just hear a little more about you know how this book came to be and what that first walk and talk was like. You know, there's an interesting thing here. When you have an opportunity to do something that might end up helping your fellow human beings, the path that you are on already on mm-hmm. is very important because. Laura just told you, look at all her interests and her needs Mm -hmm. about communication Mm -hmm. and making the world better for babies to get better water Mm -hmm. and food and the mothers too. And at the same time that she's already involved in this, my personal uh, activity was medicine Mm -hmm. for many reasons. I was working with doctors as an intuitional healer in hospitals for 20 years, volunteering had two or three good, what they call miracles. Incredible. And uh, a lot of hard work. Yeah. And I also had gotten a degree in psychology, a seven-year study, Mm -hmm. and also a degree in nutrition. And I was on the board of two top medical organizations in this country. So all of this I had gone through for 20 years Mm -hmm. when all of a sudden I become sick and don't know why Mm -hmm. for three years. Uh, the lungs, the colon, the esophagus. I didn't know what was going on. Nobody knew. And then my beautiful King Charles dog. Oh, I had a King Charles. Oh, they're, the they're the best. Well, this, they're the best. This dog starred in a TV series that Laura and I did together called Enlightened. Oh, I have a question about this, but I'll wait. You keep yeah, going. Her name was Ginger, <laughs> and she went out and got the poison, which was mixed with the dew on the grass at midnight. Mm-hmm on her paws and she came in and because of that poison on her paws being absorbed through the paw, she had three seizures, one after oh. another, and she died horribly in my arms. Oh my God. And her death, she gave up her life, ended up saving my life. It was how I found out that I'd been sprayed with these chemicals. And then Laura, you want to talk about that, honey? Well, just that yeah, our our journey started there uh, when mom ended up with double pneumonia in the hospital and the doctor discovered the the scarring on her lungs. Uh, clearly, they, they were clear it was from for environmental reasons mm-hmm. and that they didn't have a cure. And the doctor said, be gentle with your mother. I think she probably has mm. three months, maybe six oh, my gosh. at most. And the only thing you can really do is try to expand her lung capacity with getting her walking. And mm-hmm. getting a mother walking who, as she will share with you, hates walking, you know, was, was already tricky. But if your yeah. mother is an actress and loves to tell a story... Yes. You get her talking. And so that began the journey that had no intention to be a book, but just me archiving and eventually taping, recording in my mm-hmm. phone her stories for her grandchildren because we mm-hmm. believed she was dying. And we wanted 
to say everything. We wanted to share mm-hmm. everything. And we walked every day, a, a few yards further each day. Mom mm-hmm. was incredibly brave. It was very scary and painful. And it mm-hmm. turned into the blessing of our life and became a book because we hoped that other relationships, best friends, brothers and sisters, fathers and sons, that brothers and that, sons. That, mm-hmm. that other you know, families and friends would realize how much we don't say and how many questions mm-hmm. we don't ask and that it would encourage that for all of us. And we are communicators. Our job is to communicate. But you see, usually, usually parents don't tell their kids the truth, honey. No. They lie <laughs> to their children because they want to be loved and adored and respected. Mm. So they don't tell you all their secrets right. and pain yes. and things and games. And then the children, you want to be loved and respected mm-hmm. and adored. So you don't tell your parents all the truth yeah. that's going on. So here you are both lying to each other. Absolutely. And then when the parent dies, you later you say, oh, I wish I'd have asked my mother that question. Yeah. Too late. Too late. So because we thought I was dying. We just spilled the beans and told each other everything. So the motto is that everybody should take time to spill the beans. Yeah, and not wait. Because that's how you get to the truth. And the truth does set you free, by golly. (laughs) Diane, what was the most surprising thing you learned about your daughter during those walk and talks? I just learned how much she loved me. Oh. I just, the realization of the deepness of my own child's love was so profound. and. Such a the greatest blessing that I could ever have in my whole life. Her love had no bounds. And she because she knew I was dying, she just let me feel all that love. She didn't she took the mask off and it poured my brilliant, talented daughter. The love just poured out of her. One day, for example, my shoelace became untied. Mm-hmm. And I looked down and she was tying my shoelace. And I said, honey. You don't have to tie my shoelace. And these big, beautiful blue eyes looked up at me and she said, why not, Mom? You tired mine. You tied mine plenty of times. Now let it be my turn. And I just was overwhelmed. And we laughed together. And we talked. We didn't always agree. We fought. Mm-hmm. And we tell each other some. There's that story in there about the haircut. Yes. And I know I was right and she was wrong. Yes. And Laura, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I know I was right. He says, I'm right. Mom's wrong. Yeah. I'm, so we both I'm, still I'm think unbiased. We were right. And that's okay. That's okay to disagree with your loved mm-hmm. ones. It's okay to disagree with people. And also, I think we all believe that we're meant to get to this goal of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. There are things that families go through, there are things in relationships that are filled with deep trauma mm-hmm. and are it, it would be impossible to forgive, and it's not the person's responsibility to forgive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's okay, after and you. <laughs> and and so perhaps accountability, perhaps mm-hmm. listening, perhaps mm-hmm. sharing the deep conversations, and even for families who've walked through unspeakable trauma, that mm-hmm. in in the talking is the healing to have just said it and be heard. It's not with this goal to forgive or let go. Um, Or fix. Yeah, or fix. Exactly. Yeah. Because I think that the goal of understanding and listening is so different than trying to fix. And I know even as a a mom with young kids – I'm on fix it mode, right? You know, yeah. if something goes wrong, it's like, okay, this we made this choice because this and this and that, you know, and it's just trying to contextualize the world around them, um, which of course, you know, will change as they as they get older. You know, I think one thing you really hit on, Laura, is there's listening and then there's real listening, right? This yeah. deep conscious act of intentional and open understanding. You're not going to fix something. You're not going to defend something. You you might not agree with it. You might just truly be listening even if you do agree. Mm-hmm. How do we as parents make sure that we are really listening to our children and vice versa? Because we call it not just listening with your ear, but listening with the ear of your heart. Mm-hmm. You listen with the ear of your heart, you will hear your children. You will hear your mates. You will hear 
your friends. Mm -hmm. To do that, you have to push your own ego aside. You have to step back like an observer, take a minute of pause, put the emotion away. Because if there's a fight between emotion and logic, emotion will win every time. Mm -hmm. So you have to push that emotion aside for a minute. But if you listen with the ear of your heart, which is not so easy to do, Mm -hmm. but we can train ourselves to do that with each other. We really learn a lot. And I think Laura and I began to both do that a lot. We we do that anyhow. We've worked together as actresses together. Mm -hmm. And you can't be a great actress or actor if you don't listen. Well, Mm -hmm. and and I would only add to that, Mom, you know, that when we talk about it in the book, but I've been thinking about it more and more, that Mom's not immediate but eventual willingness to hear me when I shared what hurt it, mm-hmm. as a consequence to choices she made or mm-hmm. requirements of her job. And mm-hmm. even if it was unintentional hurt, she really allowed me the room to share my experience. And I, mm-hmm. I think that that was, for me, probably – as a mother, one of the more remarkable gifts mom has given me in my parenting of, Mm -hmm. you know, teenage young adults is that it really makes me take a step back and realize the radical discomfort there is in a child sharing that a choice you made has hurt them, that a job Mm -hmm. you have hurts them. It, it's our worst nightmare that we that we could ever mm-hmm. hurt our children, mm-hmm. and it's so vulnerable making. It's uh, what I realized is as a parent, which was obviously what my mother was doing. If mm-hmm. I talk them into not believing that, then it isn't so. Yeah. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like, no, 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 that didn't hurt. Actually, what I did was good for you, and you yeah, didn't. And here's why. Yeah. <laughs> but when mom <laughs> broke through that. And went, wow, Mm -hmm. you know, these are all the reasons, yes, that I had to work, but you were lonely without me. It Mm -hmm. hurt you that I was gone. It Mm -hmm. made me see the parent I've been to my kids, which is someone trying to defend and and not listen to their experience because it means I was wrong or bad or did it in a way that hurt them. And we're only going to get to move forward and become closer in our intimacy as parents and children when we accept the mistakes, when we accept mm-hmm. the imperfect, perfect relationship in loving each other, whatever that intimate mm-hmm. relationship is. So I'm so grateful to you, mom, for having given me that because I really see it every day now in my relationship with the kids. Well, I'm great. I'm grateful to the feedback you gave me because Laura said so many times, I never understood what you were going through as a mother Mm -hmm. until now I'm going through it as a mother. Mm -hmm. So when you become a mother trying to figure out how not to say which parents are prone to do, oh, but honey, if she was lonely, I'd say, oh, but honey, you got to play with your friends. And of course you got piano. I got you all these things, piano. And you, you defend the parent Mm -hmm. defends themselves. And we stop hearing our child. And it's amazing to me that I could not hear her before. And she said, Mm -hmm. oh, my God, I'm doing that with my child. So Mm -hmm. we teach each other by listening. Well, how about that we're being taught in modern progressive parenting that allowing the child to share their experience and Mm -hmm. honoring it gives them trust in themselves and trust in us. But we were all somehow on a cellular level taught that the first parental instinct when your child falls and starts to cry is, you're okay. You're okay. You're safe. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. What? What are we doing? I know. (laughs) It is. It's so true. I'm so glad you said that because I think about how often, and especially with toddlers, you know, my three-year-old who's having a meltdown about True, like nothing. Yeah. Her feelings are real. Yes. The meltdown's about the crayon. Yeah. Right. And it's, but it is, there's so much of the, you really want to use that yellow crayon. Yes. And you're really upset that the wrapper is stuck. Yeah. You know? Yes. But like just acknowledging it and saying, like, are, what ideas do you have? Yeah. What could we do? You know, you're validating it's, it's, her experience. You're validating it. Yeah. And it's like sometimes it feels silly. 
Like, honestly, yeah. sometimes I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm still talking about this yellow crayon, <laughs> but it is so powerful because I see it even in the older kid. You know, she's just a little bit older because she validates her little sister's feelings and she's yeah. seeing this around. It's incredible. Um, but I want to kind of head into this working mothers in Hollywood, you two. You know, we're talking a lot about parenting and you also have these other jobs that some people might know about. And, you know, here at Bobby, we're all about shaking stigmas. And I have to ask, you know, how emotionally complicated was it to be working on these jobs where you can't necessarily take a break? How did you navigate that stigma of, you know, I know it changed through the generations, you know, how how seriously you're taken as a working mother on set, you know, talk me through that, you know, each of you. Well, we can thank Steel Ball for helping us a great deal because it changed from the time I went on board. You couldn't, God forbid, you should have to go nurse your child. Mm. And God forbid, you need to bring your child to the set nearby. And Lucia Ball helped change all that. But even so, as women now think to people like her standing up, but the other day I was talking to Tina Fey on the phone and she said, I, and I don't know her that well, but mm-hmm. she made me cry because she said, I want to thank you and the women of your generation. Because if you hadn't fought for us, I would never have had the career that I'm having mm. now if it wasn't for you. And, I, and she was right. We did fight. And now all of you have to fight mm-hmm. to just help make the world a better place to live in. Because it's a bit of a mess right now. Mm-hmm. And we have to all fight together. And we can start by listening to each other and not judging each other so harshly. Mm-hmm. But to go back to the working environment, it's true for every working mother, mm-hmm. there is a similar parallel. Mm-hmm. And the thing is how to work that parallel so you don't pull all your hair out mm-hmm. and of your head while screaming, what do I do now? <laughs> and mom, you were blessed because you had a mother who was able to be there and help raise me when you worked. And it was someone you could trust. You know, there are so mm-hmm. many women who can't afford childcare. And mm-hmm. and if they have to, can somehow while they're holding down two or three jobs, then mm-hmm. it's relinquishing, you know, the control by trusting mm-hmm. potentially a stranger to come into your home and help watch your kid while you're at work, which is mm-hmm. Its own terrifying slippery slope, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And so it's how we just create family. I mean, we, so many of us are so blessed by a community of women, mm-hmm. you know, yes. grandmas, aunties, sisters, you know, babysitters, um, mm-hmm. the girl who lives down the street. Absolutely. Uh, you know, my amazing Imelda, who, came into my life by good fortune and Mm -hmm. helped me raise my kids while she was also raising her own sons. And, you know, you, you find your community if you're blessed and, and you can Mm -hmm. figure out a way to do it, but it's still impossible. You have to have a community. Absolutely. Even though I had my mother, my mother was older Mm -hmm. and I had to support her. And I remember she was sick sometimes And I had to get a lot of hospital care for her. Mm -hmm. So even though I had my mother, if I was working, I had to also have a live-in person Mm -hmm. to help not only my daughter, but to also help take care of of my mother. And so I had a double, a double duty thing there. And so it was very difficult. In order to do that, I too had to go gung ho to make that money and pay those bills so that we all could sustain. And when that's happening, You're so focused. I got to pay the rent. I got to get this. I got to get the insurance. And then if I'm going to go out to do a play, I got to get the money to pay somebody to take care of my child while I'm there Mm -hmm. doing the play. And everybody has similar patterns. How do you do it? And it's important for you to have friends. Mm -hmm. And that mother energy to mother that child needs somebody to talk to. Or you just get too bottled up inside. Yeah. So that's one of the ways to do it. You've got to have your adopted family. Yes. And I think Laura learned from me, she brags about it in the book, listening to the other actresses talk about the work. Mm -hmm. I I was attracted to fellow actresses. 
They didn't really care about fame or stardom. Mm -hmm. They cared about the world. Mm -hmm. My daughter does. She cares about the environment, mm -hmm. the activity, mm -hmm. the making the world a better place to live in for her child and her child's child someday. And I think all of us mothers care about that. Mm -hmm. What we care about is our heart and our soul and communicating with our family and try to get them some good food mm -hmm. and good water and good air to breathe. These are the sustenance and a good heart to listen to. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. We need each other to do this. Yes. We need each other. And I think that's why we, we call our, our book Honey Baby Mine mm -hmm. is from an old song called The Crawdad. So it's beautiful. I feel like I might adopt it for my for my baby girls. It's wonderful. It's a Woody Guthrie song. Okay. And my daddy sang it to Laura. Yeah. He would take her fishing and sing that song to her. And he sang it to me. So Laura said, let's call the book. It was Eddie. Well, Laura, you want to tell me that story how you we got that? Title? Yeah. Well, it was our beloved friend Eddie Vetter and his wife Jill who were so supportive oh to mom through this experience. I am experience. a Pearl Jam super fan, well, I have to tell you. I mean I'm starstruck just through I'm already starstruck in this conversation. Well but. let's just say <laughs> the title exists because of him. Because Incredible. I was like, we don't know what we'll name it. And he said, Well wasn't there a song your mom sang you as a kid? Wow. And I started sharing the song and he was like, that's mm -hmm. you've got to name it, honey that's baby. It. Mom. Um, I want to come back to the village aspect, you know, and this community of women that's surrounding you. I know there's an incredible story about Barbara Stanwyck sending you flowers, Diane, so a postpartum nurse finally helps you. And there's also what I find a pretty appalling story about director Martha Coolidge oh. being told she couldn't breastfeed on set. Yeah. And what's insane to me, actually, is that's unbelievable, and it's still unbelievable that we're still fighting to normalize breastfeeding, pumping at work, bottle feeding our kids, all these things. You know, it's a fight no matter which way you slice and dice it. I would love to hear about each of your feeding journeys with your kids. Uh, I was in New York and, and then in L.A. and mm -hmm. we were struggling. Well, I was pregnant with her while I was doing a movie. Okay. Uh, we were doing a movie. Her father, Bruce Duran, actor and I, mm -hmm. we were doing a movie together. But mom, isn't it true that... You know, at the time, instead of helping support you finding any way to feed your no, child, no. you had a male medical doctor say, for various reasons, they felt that it wasn't healthy or safe for you to nurse, and you had to put me on formula, correct? The doctors forbid me to nurse my child, no. which now I'd like to go beat him up. <laughs> but I, I better bless them for their caring. That's right. But you know what, Mom? <laughs> if you had fought them, I would not have had partially hydrogenated cottonseed oil oh. and sugar and <laughs> chemicals and pesticides to grow my little baby body. But well, Martha Coolidge had to put a cover over her head to nurse. They wouldn't let the director nurse her child without putting a blanket over her head, hiding the fact that she had a breast. It's crazy. More specifically, she did that just to the side of set, and they came mm -hmm. to her and said she had to go back to the trailer if she was going to yeah. nurse, because if the crew saw her feeding her child, even under a blanket, True. that mm -hmm. they would That's consider right. it a sign of weakness and not be listening to her authority. Now, this was... a a male producer yeah, involved clearly. that guided her to this belief system. It was oh, hideous, boy. hideous. Appalling. Oh, boy. So, but the great news is, you know, when I became a mother, I felt like everywhere I turned, someone was there to help me, help me mm -hmm. understand how to feed, uh, ways to feed, ways to save milk. I went through my own journey. You know, I wasn't able to feed right away. And, you know, uh, in the hospital, I just felt so taken care of in understanding mm -hmm. what I could do, but I still mm -hmm. had to fight for how I did it. And then mm -hmm. when it came to my daughter, as I mentioned, you know, I was able to feed for a period of time and then she needed more than I was mm -hmm. feeding her and she needed supplemental milk and 
when I turned to finding the right formula, I couldn't believe how just everything I found was filled with sugars and chemicals mm-hmm. and partially hydrogenated everything you can imagine yeah. um, and fillers and, mm-hmm. you know, and clearly nothing organic. And it was so shocking to me that here we were where, you know, you could get every research study on the paint you might use in a nursery, or now mm-hmm. we were so aware about, um, you know, fire retardant chemicals on mattresses, um, and that you might want to be able to find an organic mattress to protect your baby, um, in the crib, all Mm -hmm. this new wealth of information. And yet still the food we are giving our children, if for whatever reason we are unable to be feeding them, breastfeeding them was toxic. I was Mm -hmm. just shocking. I can see Angelica, while you're talking about the food, is laughing and agreeing with you because she has two young babies yes, and young children. And I can see that she's going out trying to find pure foods to help her babies have a good Mm -hmm. life and prepare them for the time they get to be my age. Mm -hmm. But back on the set, I can tell you, I didn't get any help. I didn't get any help except from a fellow female. Or once in a while, a gentleman would say, We've got to make this easier for Diane because he didn't like to see me going through this, trying to act and do a scene and worry about my daughter. Wait, 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 where is she? Lucille Ball helped change all that when she got us a room for us to let our children be safe and play in. She she created daycare when a studio head of Desilu. Yes. That's right. Wow. And so that's that's important for all working mothers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, it makes us better human beings all the way around. And fathers, too. Today, there's a lot of men. I have a friend, and he's raising his kids. He's raising those kids, and he has to go to work. So he needs a daycare. Mm-hmm. We have to be cognizant mm-hmm. of each other's needs. Yeah. I mean, that's part of that's part of the point, Yeah, right, of all of this is I think it's so easy to feel alone as parents. Even when you have a village or you think you have a village, you know, I think – I, I rely on my mom text thread, right? My group text in the middle of the night when I'm sitting on the kitchen floor, I don't know what I'm going to cook. I've given everything from the fridge to my kids. You know, it, it is that saving grace. And I think, you know, one thing, Laura, you talk about in the book, um, which feels like a huge shift, you know, from previous generations is that on the set of Big Little Lies, you had to bring one of your kids or both kids in And it was completely supported. Everyone's like, oh, you know, my kids are here too. They can all hang out. This is great. How do we... So great. So incredible. How do we cultivate more working environments like that so parents and kids can thrive despite life's demands? uh, You know, I I will speak to a director and a line producer Mm -hmm. who as men and as fathers deeply love their kids and bent over backwards to make sure we were all supported as working mothers. So it's generationally shifting as women and as men, our Mm -hmm. understanding of how we are raising the next generation. But Mm -hmm. in the area of gender equity, you know, you put women in positions of power, women take their power, women create the content, women create Mm -hmm. the podcast, women build a company like Bobby, and Mm -hmm. you find these women lifting up other women. Mm -hmm. And so I had that experience and I bring that experience up because it's the first time I did have an experience where I was even acting with other women. Right. You know, if you're a female lead in something, often, you know, you work for three days with another actress, but you're working with a bunch of men. And because mm-hmm. there weren't stories about women, <laughs> but yeah. a story about five women um, was an unbelievable and rare privilege. You know, mom and I have mm-hmm. had the privilege of working together and alongside each other. But mm-hmm. To find ourselves in an environment, as I know you find yourself, as when I've mm-hmm. been on calls for the team at Bobby, where you're with a mm-hmm. group of women helping each other navigate home and work and 
lifting up and supporting other women's stories, creating products, content, material, stories for mm-hmm. other women. I mean, it's it, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous when that happens. I got to tell you guys, also, I find that even the male generation of my age and talking to them, mm-hmm. they're more cognizant today of this need for balance. Mm-hmm. But I'm so happy to hear these men talk about how they feel more comfortable now mm-hmm. today and more cognizant Absolutely. of the human being yeah. and the and the needs for balance among everyone. But even this book, Laura, tell them about how Elwood Ellery said he read the book, our book that we wrote, her mm-hmm. own son. And then he said about asking Jaya the yeah, question just to read that he, oh, he wow. Yeah, wanted to ask his sister things that he hadn't asked before of, uh, mm. about moments that they had both gone through or she had gone through, and he hadn't mm-hmm. taken the time to say, how was that for you? Are you okay? Mm-hmm. Um, so, But I, I just want to add to what mom was saying. You know, I think we've all been raised in, with, with such a scarcity complex, you know, and mm-hmm. certainly women in positions of power, it's like, okay, there's one seat at the table. And if you're lucky, you'll yes. get in it. So you better play it like the boys, right? Yeah. Play the game. Hang on to yeah. it. Yeah. And, and for men as well, you know, don't, mm-hmm. don't show your weakness. Don't talk about your family. Mm-hmm. Don't bring that into business as opposed to, you know, the cultural shift. I think particularly in this time of the pandemic when we were all locked in our homes and on Zoom and suddenly Mm -hmm. people's kids were running in the background and the dog was barking and we were (laughs) all a shared human community trying to Mm -hmm. navigate the same trauma. And Mm -hmm. I pray it created a shift in us that we won't lose in uh, in a collective experience, that we can be kinder mm-hmm. and more compassionate to what mm-hmm. everybody is going through every day that we don't see in the business meeting or on the mm-hmm. set or, you know, while we're here talking, you know? Completely. I mean, I think that it's, I, I've given this advice to people that letting people in is so powerful. These are people you spend, your coworkers, you're with all day. You know, they they know what you had for lunch. They know what's going on. They know what you're doing every weekend, but you don't let them in yeah. to this very intimate and huge part of your life, which is parenthood, family, you know, caregiving, what have you. Exactly. And it's, I do think there's been a huge shift and I think it's, it's good. I think better work comes from it too. Absolutely. Absolutely. One thing, you know, Beyond storytellers, you two are passionate activists, and as are we here at Bobby, as you know. Um, You know, the U.S. is the only developed country without a national paid family leave policy, which is insane. Insane. How do you think we can convince lawmakers that our country desperately needs paid family leave? You know, learning, when I first learned throughout Scandinavia about paid leave for both parents, yes, I, I, I just, I was in shock. I was in shock that a friend I met, a Swedish couple that are good friends, and I worked with the father, and he was saying he was taking six months off paid leave to be with his mm-hmm. newborn baby. I just was, I marveled at that. I thought that was so mm-hmm. extraordinary to have that family bonding time. And I remember, Mm -hmm. you know, Ben needed to jump back on tour. I Mm -hmm. had a job. We both were stressed and struggling financially and had to get back to work while with a newborn and had gone through a surgery and, and, and struggling and worried. And, you know, we had to figure out ways to even be able to afford to just be with our baby. The same thing was done Mm -hmm. in Japan, Laura, when I was there uh, promoting Wild at Heart. But they were doing paid leave that first the mother took off, but then they paid the father to Mm -hmm. stay home and take care of the babies so he could see then what Mm -hmm. the mother's experiencing. He actually then, she had a month to go to work and he was home changing diapers and making diaper food. And the men said it brought them so much closer together, husband and wife. Mm-hmm. I think you girls are absolutely correct. 
Y'all take that wisdom and teach it to your kids, guys. Teach that wisdom to your kids. That is what we're trying to do. And I think it it just creates a much more equitable household. You know, yeah. your your kids see that, you know, these different grownups in their lives, caregivers, mother, mom, dad, whoever is part of that intimate village can all be trusted and can all take care of them. They can all be turned to. And I think that's so powerful, even just going back to speaking about the village. Before we go, I have to tell you one thing which I think you're going to find hilarious, which is that in Bobby's brand guidelines for for voice, one of the things we write is less stern, more dern, because we want to be, because oh we want gosh. to be warm, supportive, well-informed, and have a strong point of view, which, you know, I'm just saying, this huh. is a thing. This is Whoa. a thing you have to know. <laughs> you have to know. <laughs> that is amazing. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. And and then I do want to ask you guys for some advice. Um, what you know? What do you have to share? What advice do you share for people listening who want to forge a deeper connection with their loved ones but have no idea where to begin? Well, at the back of the book, we even suggested some prompts of questions that really mm -hmm. inspired deeper conversation mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Everyone will have their own questions and their own journey, but mm -hmm. I think there is something in being in nature that shifts mm -hmm. perspective and something in the alliance of walking side by side or mm -hmm. being on a road trip in a car that... Mm -hmm affords the space when you're looking at your surroundings, that you're not mm -hmm. staring at each other in this sort of confronted yes. dynamic across a table mm -hmm. at a restaurant. Yep. People keep interrupting and you're staring at each other going, we need to talk more honestly. It, it, yeah. There is an intimidation that happens. And nature, mm -hmm. I think, is the most beautiful guide to opening us up. And I think mm -hmm. for mom and I, the walks, the fresh air, seeing the ocean, seeing flowers around us or a dog, you know, with someone walking their dog down the street, all of those mm -hmm. things kind of gave us freedom side by side to just allow mm -hmm. conversation to occur, which then mm -hmm. opened up the doors to being more deeply communicative with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's so true. I think we find it when we go camping and we're just looking at the stars and not at each other. That's when those heavy questions come and curiosity. Yeah. And it's, it's so powerful. Diane and Laura, thank you so much. It was an absolute honor to speak with you both today. I'm so inspired by everything you do and, and how much you've let us into your lives and your continuously evolving relationship. Everyone needs to read Honey Baby Mine. And also everyone should probably call their mom. <laughs> thank exactly. you. Yeah, thank mom. you. Yes. And happy, happy Mother's mom. Day. <laughs> Yes. I'm glad you're giving her our, our book, Honey yes. Baby Mine, and give her a rose and chocolates <laughs> along with it. And God bless you and your family, your children. And thank you for thank sharing you. this. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts to Diane and Laura for bringing their full selves to this conversation and letting us into the magic of their mother daughter relationship. Be sure to follow Bobby on Instagram at Bobby for all Milk Drunk updates and sign up for the Milk Drunk newsletter at milk drunk.com. If you or someone you know is Bobby Curious, head to highbobby.com slash honeybabymine for 15% off your first organic formula order. Milk Trunk is powered by Bobby, hosted by me, Angelica Temple, and produced by Mary Kelly, Beth Rowe, and the team at Full Picture Productions. If you're liking what we're shaking here at Milk Trunk Pod, be sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss a thing. Also, if you have topics you want to hear discussed or have a hot parenting take, our DMs are always open 